Hi, Paul. Thanks for, thanks for joining me on this uh, video podcast. Um, I want to start by asking you how ironic it is that the life of the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is uh, currently depending on NHS workers. Well, yeah, and not just on NHS workers, but on uh, most likely migrant workers. Uh, I, I have relatives who've been in that hospital, St. Thomas's Hospital. It's the closest hospital to me. And I can tell you that uh, every, people from almost every nation on earth work on the front line. And um, yeah, it is ironic, but I wish the guy well. I mean, he is a human being. And, we, and at the moment, all human beings should have solidarity with each other because we're facing uh, an enemy, a threat that has... You know, unlike in war, it has no class contradictions. You know, it, it has no, the, the virus has one purpose, and that is to kill human beings. And um, I think it's it's ironic, um, not just because this party that he represents has spent 12 years trying to destroy the National Health Service and privatise it uh, and, and, and reduce uh, the real terms uh, money spent on it, but also because, um, you know, at the start of this crisis, for, for reasons I attribute to the to the hard Brexit project, the British government went out of its way to do as little as possible. I mean, it delayed the lockdown. It told, I mean, Johnson himself, I think, you know, unfortunately said live on TV, I, w I just went to a hospital where people have the coronavirus and I shook everybody's hand. His own father refused to, to, to initially to obey, obey the lockdown and say he was, he said he was going to the pub. So, you can see why you're trying to avoid stigma and you're trying to keep a semblance of normality. But in the end, um, I think that the, the British Conservative Party started this crisis with a view. It's, it's what they said. We're going to let, her, let the, 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 the virus move through the community in a controlled way, establish herd immunity and uh, not try to suppress it. This is why they have done abysmal about amounts of testing. Uh, I mean, even now, something like 10,000, I can't remember exactly, 10,000 a day is what, they're, is what they're getting. Compared to Germany, you know, 10 times that. And, and there are political reasons for this. So I hope, you know, is it through the worst, Boris Johnson will come out of, of, um, of hospital. Um, I hope he does fine. But ultimately, the party that he leads is the party that has depleted our, the resilience of our health service and screwed up, I'm sorry, screwed up the first two weeks of this crisis. Do you think there is a chance, even a tiny chance, that after going through this ordeal uh, at the, you know, with the NHS, and um, Boris Johnson might rethink? Well, uh, look, Boris Johnson has already been described as a as a British gaullist, as as a as a right wing nationalist, big state conservative. No. In his mind, maybe that's what he is. He just didn't do much until uh, the first budget, which was held on the 8th of March, which was in, in, its, in its own way overwhelmed by the coronavirus. Um, they were trying to, uh, they, they'd stopped a few tax cuts. They'd certainly spent more money on the NHS already and promised to do so. And they, because, as you know, they captured these key series of working class communities in the December election. They were committed to try and do some more public spending there. But so you know, Johnson himself said from his uh, his isolation room, well, at least we learned that society does exist. Now, this was an explicit critique of Margaret Thatcher, who famously said society, there is no such thing as society. So he's a different kind of conservative. But the lesson not yet learned and it's a lesson of, of acute uh, relevance to everybody listening to this in, inside the European Union, is that there can't be a hard Brexit. There certainly can't be the threat of a no-deal Brexit. Before, I mean, our Treasury in Britain stopped counting. It stopped trying to calculate what the impact of a no-deal Brexit would be, despite the fact that this, the, ex, the threat of no-deal is an explicit part of Johnson's policy enunciated on the 3rd of, Feb, 3rd of February. But the last time they did count, the British uh, Treasury said, if we get a no deal Brexit, then the, in 15 years time, GDP will be 7% lower than what it would be if we get a smooth Brexit. This is when they expected growth. We're now expecting world trade to collapse by a third this year. We're expecting Britain's economy to contract by 6 to 
this year. The Eurozone will probably be likewise America 11 percent. The idea that you're going to walk off a cliff and say to 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 Van der Leyen and to Barnier, screw you, we're walking away to a, a bright new future of free trade with the rest of the world. It's, it's, it's just it, it would be madness. And so what this the health crisis around Johnson, the fact that he's in the hospital has masked the political crisis that his policy on Brexit do, no longer makes sense. You just mentioned the, the Eurozone. What do you make about the response of the European Union? Well, look, we're, I'm, I'm still digesting last night's uh, deal uh, over the uh, the use of the uh, the stability mechanism uh, to to allow non conditional spending on healthcare and well being. No, that's better than where we were last week when the Dutch and German governments were literally trying to screw the the periphery the peripheral governments to an immediate kind of austerity commitment. But it, but unfortunately, the deal that was done last night still contains the promise of austerity after this is over. And it still avoids the existential problem of the need to mutualize Europe's debts. Um, you've got, not even, it's not even the right in Germany, it's social democracy, Olaf Scholz, opposing the idea of euro bonds. Now, some of your other people you've interviewed, Yanis Varoufakis overnight has been saying, you know, this is a catastrophe, it's a disaster. I don't think it yet is. I think that the peripheral governments, Conte and Sanchez, made a very strong case. They also brought the Irish government, which had traditionally been very neoliberal, over to the side of a, a corona bond. And I think that the task of us on the left and progressive centre of, of, of European politics is to carry on arguing for, for debt mutualisation. Um, the reason why it's not the end of the world that last night uh, we didn't get it is that it only matters at the point where, you know, we're going to have huge, you know, in excess of 100 percent of GDP debts uh, racked up across the eurozone now. Uh, when we get to the end of this, the, the call will come for austerity. And I think that's where the left has to say to the German Social Democrats, to Mark Rutter in The Hague, no, there'll be no austerity. And if, it, if that breaks the eurozone, so be it. I, I'm a very pro-European leftist. You know, I'm a left globalist. But the eurozone and the Lisbon Treaty, I, I think, are both things that should be negotiable. That is frangible. We should we should think that if they're going to break us, we can break them. Um, and I think that that moment will come, say, in the middle of 2021, when uh, the Eurozone authorities and, and the Bundesbank really start pushing Southern Europe for austerity. At that point, we just say no. At that point, I think that's the time where you issue the nine nine member Corona bond and then you challenge the ECB. Because Look, Lagarde, for all the criticism that I would have of her during the euro crisis, she is not a, an unintelligent neoliberal. Lagarde understands and the, the ECB's actual staff understand monetization is coming. If every big country in the world is doing aggressive quantitative easing and then whether it's subtle or unsubtle, Britain's doing it subtly. They're subtly monetizing the debt. So you know, that, that is they're, they're almost borrowing direct the state is borrowing direct in Britain now to the tune of probably 20 billion from the central bank. When that gets to 200 billion, if the eurozone is the only big block in the world that is not monetizing its debt, that's the problem. That's the point where the eurozone actually becomes the weakest link in the global system. And on behalf of its citizens, it must change. So I think don't give up the fact that we didn't win last night. Don't give up the long term uh, argument. For, for debt mutualization in Europe. Okay, so so you say no to austerity. Um, yeah. So what do you do? Do you make the, the rich pay? And how do you do that? Look, I, do, I think within, especially because we already have welfare states in Europe, that we found this with Labour in, in Labour's uh, policy making under Jeremy Corbyn. In, we decided there's, you could probably get an extra 50 billion a year in tax from the rich, from corporations. You can't get 100 billion, an extra 100, you know. But just to do the Green New Deal, to do the 
post-carbon transformation. We needed to borrow in Britain 250 billion over 10 years. So it's borrowing rather than taxation that has to take the long, the, 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 the strain, certainly of climate change, and I would argue of the pandemic hit. Because the great mantra, I was on a Zoom discussion with Hella Torning Schmidt from the, the ex-Prime Minister of Denmark, Social Democrat, and she's going, we can't let the future generations pay for this. I'm sorry, we have to let the future generations pay for this because any further austerity, it won't just, as in the 2010 era, you know, flatline the economy. This time it will just, it's absolutely certain to produce far right governments. Uh, and look, the, think about it from the European point of view. If you're a Europeanist and you want this, this project to succeed, I want it to succeed even though I'm now outside it. Um, <clears throat> if, if the outcome of imposing austerity is that Salvini takes power in his own right in Italy, that Le Pen takes power in France, that um, you know the AFD grows and then it splinters German, uh, the C CDU, CSU, FDP wing, and they start moving in a nationalist direction. I'm afraid, and then Vox, you know, Vox plus the Partido Popular in Spain, if they all win elections simultaneously, the Europe is over. So to save it, you've got to do radical things. And uh, I think that, you know, so no to austerity. Yes, to the onshoring of offshore wealth, because the reason you can't get so much more taxation out of developed world welfare states is because we've allowed capital to move to the Bahamas, Madagascar, the Cayman Islands, all the rest of it. And some people estimate there's as much as 30 trillion sitting in those offshore um, in those offshore vehicles, if the one thing the European Union could do if it doesn't want to do mutualization is to aggressively bring capital back onshore. And there the culprits are the usual people, Ireland, Luxembourg, Monaco, Malta. You know, those governments then have to get real about not being a conduit into the offshore world, but indeed being a conduit for the money coming back into the taxation system of Europe. Okay, finally, um, you've, you've stated quite a few times in your books that the 2008 crisis could or should enable us, in a way, um, as the left, as people, as movements, to build a better future, uh, a better society. Do you think this could be the crisis that enables us to move forward for a better world? Look, the one difference I've noticed... After 2008, there were no voices in the elite. I mean, uh, Sarkozy uh, got a, a copy of Das Capital and, fl and demonstratively flipped it open in some kind of press conference. But there were no voices that even did what John Maynard Keynes did for liberalism in the 1930s that said the old, the old economic model is gone. We need a new economic model, a new paradigm. Now you're starting to hear it. 12 years too late. The British Financial Times, its editorial board has basically become social democratic, left social democratic, for now, temporarily. We're seeing, I think, politicians who, like Sanchez, uh, you know, like, uh, like, you know, some of the, of the left social democrats in Germany, in 2008, they just accepted the neoliberal uh, orthodoxy. Now they're changing. I think we're seeing... One of the reasons for this is actually that American right wing economics is moving far more in an activist way. I.e., they're going to the American uh, conservative sort of center right. I'm talking here about you know the classic sort of ex central bankers. They're saying, look, you know, print money, print money now and and spend it. Um, so I think we 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 have more of a chance now of of breaking parts of the centrist centrist elite to a progressive economic policy. And one of the reasons why is I think that if they didn't care about redistribution and social justice after 2008, they actually do care about democracy and some of them. And they care about the possibility of seeing an AFD Vox, you know, uh, Lega Nord government in Europe. Um, and they don't like that idea. So I'm not popular on the British left at the moment because I've been overtly making the case for a 1935 style turn by the left towards attempting 
a temporary but strategic alliance with the centre to defend democracy, human rights and the rule of law. It's very much up to the centre whether they want to do that or whether they want to go down the route of austerity, of greater uh, encroachment on the rule of law and abandon universalism and put borders up everywhere in Europe. Some of them want to do that. But the ones that don't, I think we, we on the left have to do what, you know, uh, a long lost communist leader, Georgi Dimitrov, did in 1935. He said to the left, look, class against class isn't working. Class against class for now produces fascism. So we need to seek allies between an alliance between today. What is it? It's the Greens in Germany. It's it's the Die Linke in Germany. It's the left of the SPD in Germany. And they go together and they say they've got to say to the to the CDU, CSU, it's decision time, guys, because if you want to do 2008 again, we, we can't defend democracy on our own. Look at Thuringia. Look at, you know, uh, large parts of eastern Germany, AFD on double digits and growing in this crisis. We, there's only so many Antifa mobilizations we can do until you, the center, have to actually stop this, this stuff. And you stop it not through repression, because that doesn't work in this situation. You stop it through creating the kind of economy people want to be part of. So I think that's the stark message I would leave people with for now.